What's up ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to an all new let's play of Hearts of Iron 4 where we are about to dive on into a brand new campaign on the 1st of January 1936. We are going to be playing as the French Empire but don't get me wrong we have played as the United States, we have played as the German Reich, Italy, Japan, and even the Soviet Union, but two countries that we have never really played as would be France and Poland. Now, the reason why we haven't played as either of these countries is because that historically, both of these countries get absolutely annihilated within just the first few months of the war. So as you can see, both of these countries are going to have an incredibly difficult initial challenge. But don't get me wrong, I believe we have played Hearts of Iron 4 for such a long time that I do possess a few tips and tricks of my own where we can see this campaign through to the end. I think we can make this entire campaign worthwhile as well as fun and exciting. Now, the French Empire is led by Edward Daladie himself. We are a democratic ideology. Therefore, we technically have a democratic regime with elections every four years in April. I also want to point out, much like every other Hearts of Iron 4 country, there are a variety of bonuses and detriments that make the country unique, as well as give it a flavorful playstyle. Now, sadly enough, the French Empire is absolutely plagued with detriments. So the very first one is the victors of the Great War. Not only do we lose recruitable population, but all of our land doctrine research times are actually more expensive. They cost 75% more time to research. And what exactly does this mean? Having emerged victorious from the Great War, the army has developed a dangerously complacent attitude, which causes strategic developments to come slowly and with some reluctance. So if you're a student of history, you'll probably remember that obviously France was victorious in World War I, and all of its leaders and generals were basically a little cocky and a little arrogant because after all, uh, they were victorious in the first war. But so they had this mindset, if it, if it works, don't try to fix it. So they were kind of a little reluctant to embrace new technologies and obviously the new research projects obviously would go ahead and influence the way that all of their tactics and strategies would pan out. So for example, uh, I guess we'll just talk a little bit about the radio. So that would be a perfect example of why France, uh, France was not really all that innovative. So let's go ahead and continue on. Sadly enough, we do have another detriment which is actually absolutely horrible. We have disjointed government. It doesn't seem really that bad when you glance at it, but I could promise you this is going to be our number one priority that we want to remove. So every day, we lose daily political power cost. So 0.8 doesn't seem like a lot, but I promise you this is going to be one of the biggest hindrances of this entire campaign. And not only do we lose political power, but we lose national unity. And the state of French politics is far from stable. While reforms are needed and welcome, the nation is divided, and getting drawn into a conflict would put it at great risk. Now, finally, we actually have the Maginot Line, which is the only bonus that France actually seems to have. So not only do we gain more max planning speed, but it is a little bit, t it's going to take a little bit longer to get there. But don't get me wrong, 25% more planning is actually amazing. Having fortified the border gives France the opportunity to plan and prepare carefully, but it does sacrifice some flexibility in the event of something unexpected. So basically, if you're, a, uh, once again, if you're a student of history, you'll know that the Maginot Line, is basically a series of underground forts and bunkers and the idea is this is an incredibly difficult and fortified position to prevent German aggression. Now all of these forts and underground bunkers are located in eastern France along the Rhine River. So it's a lot of rugged territory, a lot of mountainous territories, and I'll go ahead and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But so there are incredibly powerful forts on our eastern border and of course much like every other hearts of iron fork uh you know country you have the ability to play historically such as the democratic france which is what we're going to do and of course you can play as communistic or fascist france so let's go ahead and dive on in here 
Now, one thing I do want to point out, we are going to be playing on Iron Man mode, and if you look at the top of the screen, it's going to say noon on the 1st of January of 1936. We are actually going to go ahead and load up a save. It's one hour into the future, and as you can see, it's still Iron Man because of this fist. And so what we're going to do is I'll talk a little bit more about why I'm going to do this. But let's go ahead and dive on in. The reason why is every time you start a Hearts of Iron 4 playthrough, all of your air wings, all of your naval divisions, all of your uh, military troops are all in a basic smorgasbord with no leaders assigned or anything like that. So my number one priority is I went ahead and I basically, before I even started recording, I organized all of my theaters because basically you have to create your own theaters and you have to go ahead and color coordinate all of your units. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about what I've done. So as you can see, we have 24 troops here. It is led by Charles de Gaulle himself. I did not actually build any units. All I did is I reorganized all of the troops I had. It was a big smorgasbord and it was a little bit daunting. But so what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna take all 24 of these troops and instead of creating a front line, I'm actually going to create a fallback line Line on the coast of Belgium whoops and so the idea and behind Luxembourg and so the idea all of my infantry troops are basically going to go ahead they're gonna run on over to this front line and they are going to dig themselves in now we are missing a lot of equipment as you can see these infantry troops do not have so the green is morale the orange is the actual equipment so we have health and how much equipment they have morale is health if you are unfamiliar logistics is how much infantry equipment we have right now we are missing 4.4 thousand infantry equipment which is actually terrible but it's gonna get a lot worse when I start making some changes okay so my second group um, basically these are pretty much all colonial troops they were from Africa I'm going to bring them on up to France and I am going to create a front line this time rather than a fallback line. And I want to go ahead and put it on that Maginot line I was talking about. Now this is all rugged terrain, it's all hillsides, it's all mountainous uh, territory. So I want to go ahead and switch all of these troops over to Mountaineers. And the reason why is because they're going to not only have better defense, but have better attack. <coughs> excuse me, on uh, this territory. So I also want to go ahead and see if I can bring it any farther over, and it looks like I can. And finally, we actually do have some Mountaineers. All of these troops are, of course, green because they are going to be the Italian front. And what I want to do is start putting these troops in the Alpine territories. Now, as you can see, we only have four actual Mountaineers. So what I want to do is bring over more of our African troops, switch them over to Mountaineers as well. And I want to bring them over to the Italian front. We currently only have four units on this line, but we have ten people in this division, or I guess this... Uh, uh, what battalion so let's go ahead and throw those on over as well and we also have some additional infantry units that I probably will never use I should have made this green but I decided against it for some reason we're going to bring them on over to Italy these people need to be mountaineers as well and finally I do want to talk a little bit about our tanks so we are not actually going to be using any of these tanks at all and sadly enough I feel like our number one priority is going to be a defensive positioning rather than building offensive capability, which are basically these light tanks. So what I'm actually going to do, all of these units are going to switch on over to Mountaineers and they're going to swing on down to France. So right now we have 17 troops, 17 Mountaineers inside the Alpine territories, which is good. And we also have one additional light tank. Now, because we already had a bunch of motorized divisions, I actually wanted eight motorized divisions in Africa. I think seven is a little bit too weak. So what we're going to do is take this orange group, switch it over to motorized. We probably don't have enough uh, motorized units. Yeah, we only have one available and we need 250. So let's go ahead and bring down this unit to the African frontier. And just like that, that is basically going to be where all of our troops will be. So let's go ahead and take our uh, motorized divisions. We haven't even really unpaused the game yet. 
you're all going to go over to Tunisia. And just like that, I think we're finally ready to take a glance at some of our research and production. Now, before I started the game, uh, I did mention that I went ahead and I reorganized all of my naval units. So basically, all of our submarines, all of our Mediterranean fleets, they are all coming on over, at least for the most part. Some units are going to be going over to northern France. But most of these units are going to become one massive consolidated regiment. So rather than having a bunch of like 30 ships everywhere, we're going to have one massive stack of about 100. And I feel like it's going to make everything a little bit easier. I also went ahead and I actually put uh, you know plans for all of our fighters and all of our bombers. So not only were they just sitting in their air base, but now they are going to be providing air superiority and close air support. And this is just in northern France, but I've done it pretty much in Africa and in southern France as well. So let's go ahead and finally take a glance at our research. As you can see, it is the 1st of January, 1936, and with 0% world tension, I want to play as historical as possible. So the idea is because we really have nothing to fear right now, because there's no world tension, we're going to focus on our economy like every other country in the world. So let's go ahead and click our research, move all the way over to the industry tab. And the very first thing that we want to start researching is better construction speed. So all of our factories are going to be producing 10% quicker as well as giving us some research. So this is actually pretty broken. So the number one thing is you want to get this as soon as possible. And of course, we are in our industry tab as well. Not only are our factories going to be producing quicker, but we are also going to be improving the efficiency at which our factories produce equipment. Now, these are going to be military factories rather than civilian factories, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And finally, now that we have finished up two in industry, we're going to switch on over to engineering and start out with electronic engineering. Now, it doesn't seem like a big deal, a 2% research time reduction, but I promise you this is probably one of the best research uh, technologies you could start off with. It is going to make a world of difference, so a small investment now will pay off um, you know, a lot of dividends later on. Let's go ahead and take a look at our actual construction. So we have 35 um, civilian factories, and right now, 13 of those civilian factories are basically being used for consumer goods purposes. So we don't have access to 13, but we do have access, whatever 13 minus 35 is, 35 minus 13, and that's what we have available, 22. So the idea is if you're not familiar with Hearts of Iron 4, civilian factories are essentially the backbone of your economy. So the more civilian factories you have, the healthier your economy will be. So every 15 civilian factories, so let's go ahead and queue up about six, um, I guess, factories. So we're going to go ahead and put these in places with high infrastructure. Now, I realize that 60% uh, faster production rather than 80% is not necessarily that much of a difference. But for the sake of simplicity, I want to go ahead and uh, just max out the quicker uh, units as quickly as we can. So I want to go ahead and build six civilian factories. And as you can see, every 15 civilian factories we have creates a full work order. So everything over 15 civilian factories actually gets cycled down to the next production queue. So as you can see, the more civilian factories we have, the more that our country is going to be able to produce. So rather than only improving your economy, uh, we can also start also improving infrastructure and air bases and I guess like naval bases and dockyards at the same time. So what we want to do is get more civilian factories as soon as possible. All right, we also want to take a quick glance at our national focuses. So basically what a national focus is, is our leader here, Edward Daladi. He has the ability to basically lend a helping hand and to guide the country into where he thinks will basically prosper the most. So right now we can have uh, an economic tree. We have a military tree. Uh, we have a governmental slash political reform tree, which is actually what we're going to be going through. We have a naval focus and we have an air focus, and that's about it. So our number one priority is to remove the disjointed government as quickly as possible. Like I said, this is absolutely atrocious. Not only do we lose national unity, which is basically like countrywide health, 
but we also are losing a monumental amount of daily political power, which is the number one reason why we got to get rid of this. So the idea is if we can reform the government and fix it, <laughs> we're finally going to go ahead and remove that. So we got to go all the way down here to defensive stratagems, but our number one priority is to reform the government and we're going to gain 120 political power. So all of these national focuses take about 70 days each. So once this is completed, we're going to be gaining 120 political power. And if you're not familiar with uh, political power, it's basically like this currency where you have the ability to go ahead and purchase new advisors. You have the uh, ability to purchase new military theorists. You can go ahead and improve your economy with your economic laws. You can have change conscription laws. You can, um, you know, bring new tank designers, etc., etc. So political power is useful, but you know it's really more useful in the beginning of the game rather than the end of the game. So my number one priority, if I could somehow reach 150 political power, I want to go ahead and hire an advisor called a silent workhorse now he's going to be giving us a 15 percent political power gain which really isn't that much but i'm hoping it's going to be an investment whereas the earlier i get it the quicker it'll pay off so this is incredibly expensive but i think it's definitely going to be uh, paying off dividends in the future looking at our outdated equipment and production we are actually producing a rank one submarine and you're probably thinking well if we have rank two submarines why would we build an older variant and the idea is because this is already in production i could go ahead and cancel this altogether, but then i would really waste about two or three weeks of production i mean it's almost done so we might as well just finish it on up taking a look around as you can remember i removed all of my light tanks um and i basically changed them over to mountaineers and motorized so i am going to delete this item altogether. i don't really think i'm going to use them at least early on in the campaign and as you can see, we now have one extra military factory, and we are going to throw that in into our motorized divisions. All of our naval fleets are going to be producing in the island, not island, in the port of Provence. So rather than in the beginning of the game, uh, throwing these onto any available port, we're, all, we're going to try to consolidate our entire navy. And I'm looking around the map. We also need to go ahead and uh, import some oil. Now, this is our trade tab, also known as our resources tab. And right now, we have excess resources of just about everything but oil. So if we look at the oil tab, we can basically try to import oil from other countries. So the idea is we now need to think about, well, we see every country has a lot of oil and they're all the similar prices, but whose economy do we want to go ahead and improve? And so the idea is we're democratic. Actually, I don't think we can look at it now. Uh, we're democratic, and I know for a fact that other countries like the United States and the United Kingdom are all democratic. So the idea is I would like to improve the economy of the United Kingdom, but they don't really have that much oil, and we're going to be using a lot more. So let's go ahead and start opening up trade routes with the United States. We are going to be importing 16 oil, and we need 10. But as you can remember, there is no currency in Hearts of Iron 4. So basically what we're doing is we are lending uh, the United States to civilian factories for some oil that they're not using. So yes, we're going to be producing buildings a little bit slower, but at least we now have oil to start pumping out as many units as possible. Okay, and once I go ahead and let the uh, day go by... Um, this uh, insufficient resource tab is going to go away. Another thing I want to point out is we are lacking a lot of manpower. Right now it says 305,000 manpower, but every time a ship gets produced, we are going to be losing manpower. And in fact, uh, because I changed up so many units, I believe like the colonial divisions only have just a few yeah, amount of sure. troops whereas these mountaineers are absolutely massive. So not only did we go from 4.4 thousand uh, lack of infantry equipment, but now we're at negative 41 thousand, and I'm surprised it's even that low. It probably should have been a lot higher. But uh, let's go ahead and finally dive on into our campaign. And as you can see, all of our troops are finally going over to where they need to be, except I didn't actually move my military police, which are my cavalry units. 
Okay, and just like that, all of our fleets are finally making it over to where they need to be. And it looks like that submarine was finally built. So I have three additional naval dockyards, and I think my number one priority is to basically just go through the queues as it is. So we're going to produce four submarines, and then once these are done, all of these dockyards are then going to go down to the destroyers, which obviously costs more. And you can, if you were curious how much they cost, you can see it's 990 production cost, whereas a battle cruiser is 8,000. So obviously these are incredibly expensive the farther down they go, whereas a submarine is only 500. So these are going to be finished up fairly quickly and let's go ahead and unpause the game and one of my biggest priorities like I said is to remove the disjointed government which is in defensive stratagems and if I could somehow remove this I'm gonna finally have a lot more political power which means I can finally do a lot more with our economy and our conscription so that's gonna be one of our biggest goals and we are missing so much infantry equipment, it is actually a little scary. Looks like we have a hundred ships here. I'm wondering if the ships ever arrived from Vietnam. If you are unfamiliar, we do own Vietnam. We do own Madagascar. We own a variety of islands all around the world and inside the Pacific. We own the Western Sahara. We own most of Morocco and most of Tunisia. And basically, that is pretty much what the world looks like. So most of our ships have finally arrived. Let's go ahead and merge them all together. And we're going to put the most powerful admiral we have, uh, which I guess we have two uh, identical admirals, both at rank three. And I guess they're both superior tacticians. So let's go ahead and put one down in the Mediterranean, and we will put another down inside northern France. Now you can see we do have one carrier, which I'm actually excited about. So we'll go ahead and throw on another level 3 Admiral, and we're going to keep them in the port for now. I don't really plan on moving these units around the Mediterranean. Okay, so our civilian factories are being produced, and I'm happy that these are 80% more efficient. I'm wondering how we got another four, military, uh, four civilian factories. I'm guessing we're trading resources, but I don't know how to verify that. So obviously we are probably giving away something we have a lot of excess of, such as steel or maybe aluminum. And just like that, we have finally finished our very first national focus because we're on speed five. And the idea is we now have 120 political power where we can finally cash that in once we get 150 for a new advisor. Okay, I do want to mention this really quickly. We have the remilitarization of the Rhineland. So if you are unfamiliar with the Treaty of Versailles, so after World War I, the United Kingdom and France basically stripped the German uh, Reich of a lot of their power. So not only did they lose places like Austria, they lost the Sudetenland territory, and they basically, the French, were a little concerned about future German aggression. So in the Treaty of Versailles, they basically tried to enforce a demilitarized zone, which should actually be west of the Rhine River. I'm not sure why it's this entire area. But the idea is, you know, France wanted to prevent future German aggression. And obviously the German Reich was, you know, why if I own this territory, why can't I put in uh, units of my own? And so obviously this is where we stand. So the German Reich has just violated the Treaty of Versailles. There goes 5% world tension. So the entire country is a little upset, but uh, the entire world is a little upset. But several German divisions recently advanced to the Rhineland, marking the first time since the end of the Great War that Germany has forces positioned west of the Rhine. This is in clear violation of the Versailles Treaty, under which Germany is forbidden from militarizing the region. Unless we issue an ultimatum demanding their withdrawal, the treaty will not be enforced. So basically, I could go to war right now because they violated the treaty, but I am down 50,000 units of infantry equipment. So if I was to go to war, I would get absolutely annihilated and United Kingdom would not join in. So the United Kingdom wants me to issue a diplomatic objection. And sadly, this is what we are going to do. I am not ready for a war. So let's go ahead and uh, point fingers. Okay, now we need another national focus. We have worked on reforming the government. 
And as you can see, we find ourselves at our very first crossroads. We could go ahead and support the status quo, or we can revise the Versailles Treaty. Because we want to play historically, we are going to stay democratic, whereas this would eventually lead to communism or fascism. But let's go ahead and support the status quo for more national unity. You can read this if you'd like. But yeah, we went from 300,000 manpower all the way down to 132,000. Obviously, the political power is gaining, but at an incredibly slow rate. But yeah, um, we are definitely growing in world tension, so World War II is brewing. And it looks like electronic mechanical engineering has now been researched. We will now go ahead and start working on mechanical computing giving us an increased 3% research reduction. So not only did we have 2%, but we're eventually going to get another 3% for a total of negative 5%. And because of our trade laws, we're, we already have negative 5%. So this negative 7 at that you can see right here is going to go to negative 10%. So uh, that's going to be really, really awesome. And I'm looking around, it looks like a lot of our ships are now being constructed. Uh, two submarines and one destroyer have both been purchased. And we also have election communists in government. The communist movement in France, fueled by broad dissatisfaction among the working class and radical trends among academics, has grown large enough to lead to the formation of several parties. After one of these has gained considerable support in the current election, politicians and party radicale have started debating whether or not to seek their support in forming a government. Although they consider our democratic institutions to be little more than bourgeoisie tyranny, they seem eager to make the changes they want to see through cooperation operating with the government rather than overthrowing it. So basically where we stand is we have a very large communist party inside France and we could go ahead and our leader could embrace this party or we could go ahead and stay democratic but you know obviously tank a little bit of our unity. So let's go ahead and try to stay as democratic as possible. A broad coalition of democratic parties is preferable. So sadly enough, we did just lose a little bit of national unity, which is horrible, but uh, I'm hoping that once we fix this disjointed government, we could go ahead and start improving the strength of France. Well, sadly enough, this has been 27 minutes, so I am going to go ahead and end this episode. But thank you all for joining me. Hope you all have an awesome day, and I will see you in our next adventure.